knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. With the fall of the Roman Empire formally assigned the date of 476 AD at the hands of Germanic tribes, the Vandals and Ostrogoths, a cultural vacuum ensued, which inevitably affected medicine and pharmacy. The cultural center of Europe gradually moved from Rome to other Italian cities, such as Milan, and especially to the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, Constantinople, or Byzantium. These are the Latin and Greek names, respectively, for the modern city of Istanbul in present-day Turkey. Byzantium rose as a central power and reached its apex around the 8th and 9th centuries AD, after which it began its decline as a political power. It was not formally conquered until 1453 at the hands of the Ottomans, led by 21-year-old Mehmed the Conqueror. However, Arabic culture, in a climate of enlightenment and freedom of thought, had already taken over the great Greco-Roman heritage. Works by the Greeks and Romans were translated into Arabic, and science advanced substantially over the next two centuries in their care. Most notably, branches of science like chemistry and pharmacy flourished in the Arab world. The first apothecary shops appeared in Persia around 850 AD. The pharmacy profession, at the time consisting mainly of the preparation of oils, unguents, and concoctions, was formally separated from medicine. The pharmacists had to be educated through a specific curriculum and were required to swear an oath of ethics. Their pharmacopoeia included traditional Greek and Roman ingredients, as well as a growing number of Persian and Indian plant extracts, and even inorganic chemicals. At the time, Baghdad was the primary center for pharmacy and medicine in the world. Its medical school and hospital represented the pinnacle of excellence for these early days of medicine. An important figure in the Arab world, one so legendary that some doubt his actual existence, is represented by Jabir ibn Hayyan, a scientist and philosopher often referred to as the father of chemistry. Abu Musa Jabir ibn Hayyan may have been an Arab or a Persian by ethnicity and was born in 721 AD in the town of Tus in Khorasan, in present-day Iran, but which at that time was part of the Umayyad Caliphate. Jabir left an astounding number of treatises, about 3,000 in total, leading experts to believe his followers may have authored a substantial number of them. They form what is called the Jabirian Corpus, and a short description of it is relevant in understanding where our knowledge of chemistry, or rather alchemy, as well as medicine, stood in the 9th century. Much of his work is written in a complex code, and not all of it can be translated or interpreted. In fact, it is thought that the word gibberish, which is a word that refers to unintelligible and nonsensical speech or writing, comes from geber, the Latin equivalent of jabir. Jabir made one of the first attempts to catalog chemical elements according to a numerical system, vaguely reminiscent of Mendeleev's periodic table of the elements. He divided the elements into spirits, or volatile elements, metals, and nonmetals. All the metals contained different proportions of sulfur-likeness and mercury-likeness, which essentially sounds like a first attempt at characterizing electronic properties. This theory was revitalized by Paracelsus six centuries later. Jabir even developed a basic theory of molar equivalence that Europe rediscovered about a thousand years later. In the chemistry lab, the Arabs practiced extractions, calcination, sublimation, crystallization, and distillation, for which Jabir invented a new tool, the alembic. Jabir left detailed protocols for isolating citric acid and acetic acid, distilling ethanol, and crystallizing tartaric acid from grape juice. He also described the synthesis of ammonium chloride, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and aqua regia, which dissolves gold. He developed the first samples of steel, invented the dyeing of cloth, the waterproofing of cloth, and even some anti-rust paints. 
The medieval Islamic tradition introduced the use of lab chemicals, mostly inorganic, as cures to disease, and in this fashion Jabir's work in chemistry was an important first interface with pharmacy, a link which is the basis of modern pharmacology. Jabir was never a physician, yet he practiced the profession of pharmacist. He wrote a comprehensive book of poisons, including poisons of animal, plant, and mineral origin, and their pharmacological effect on patients. Many scholars consider this book to be the first link between chemistry and medicine. It is intriguing to acknowledge that inorganic materials were thought by Jabir and his school to be beneficial to health, when in the West the theory of vitalism held sway until the early 19th century, which was the belief that living organisms depend on forces and principles that are distinct from non-living or purely chemical phenomena. How could inorganic chemicals affect the chemistry of living beings, which were thought to be endowed with some vital spirit? It is an important philosophical distinction, and we will revisit this theme several times throughout this series. The next pivotal figure in medicine was Abu Ali al-Hussein ibn Abd Allah ibn Sina, or Ibn Sina for short, and simplified in Latin to Avicenna. He was a Persian physician and polymath. He was born near Bukhara in present-day Uzbekistan in the year 980. He led a nomadic life, traveling through Asia and practicing medicine. His masterwork in the field of medicine, the canon of medicine, translated into Latin in the 13th century, was a key reference book for hundreds of years. It was the key medical document in medieval Europe as well as the Islamic world, and remained an important medical reference text until the 18th century. Avicenna expanded Hippocrates' theory of the four humors, in combination with the theory of the four temperaments, which are called sanguine, choleric, melancholic, and phlegmatic, after the humors they correlate with. He applied this mode of thought to what he referred to as emotional aspects, mental capacity, moral attitudes, self-awareness, and movements and dreams as causes of disease. Thus, to him, disease was not just caused by external factors, but also by individual predisposition. We would say today, in slight agreement with Avicenna, that our genes play a major role in around 80% of disease. Avicenna left behind a long list of preferred drugs and about 800 treatments with detailed instructions on their administration, as well as painstaking observation and description of a host of important diseases. This extreme detail made his work of paramount importance, even when it was eventually realized that his theories had no scientific foundation. Due to increasing religious intolerance in the Arab world, the medical profession moved back to Europe in the 11th century. An important school was set up in Salerno, Italy, where the Arab tradition was reintegrated into the European canon. Unfortunately, the Middle Ages were a miserable time to be alive in Europe. Endless war and strife was interrupted by brief periods of peace, which were marred by frequent epidemics, some of which were of horrendous proportions. Life was brutish and short, and religion found a fertile ground of misery on which to thrive. In general, independent thought and scientific ideas were not seen favorably by the church, and this led to the persecution of freethinkers and a general stagnation of the pharmacy profession, among many others. Although apothecaries were established all over Europe and began to be regulated as a guild, very little progress was made in terms of cures. As we mentioned, epidemics devastated the continent. For example, we can examine how the Black Death, a particularly intense plague, ravaged Europe as the medical profession watched helplessly. This truly is the next major chapter in our story, so let's get a closer look at these plagues next. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.